And welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm Lori LeBay, the host and founder of Alzheimer's Speaks. For those of you that are new to the show, Alzheimer's Speaks is an advocacy based company providing multiple platforms to help shift our dementia care culture from crisis to comfort around the world. We believe that by joining forces and sharing knowledge and just having these everyday conversations about life with dementia and caring for others, we can remove some of the stigmas attached to memory loss and help those living with um, some type of illness uh, continue to live with purpose. Together, we can help everybody understand the true needs of caring. At our core, Alzheimer Speaks believes that collaboratively is the only way we're going to win the battle against dementia. And I know it's working thanks to all of you. You see, it's your clicks, your likes, your shares that got us named the number one influencer online regarding Alzheimer's, according to Share Care and Dr. Oz. So again, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I hope you continue to take those couple of seconds while you're listening to the show, and just like this and share it with your Facebook friends, uh, share it with your LinkedIn colleagues, your Pinterest people, your Twitter tribes, and any of the other multitudes of social media out there. There's so many people in our circles of influence that are dealing with dementia or caring for uh, someone that they love. And, you know, we never know when they're going to be ready to really reach out and get that information. So it's very helpful to have that out. It makes makes people feel like it's a little bit more normal, it takes a little of the scary out there. So, again, I really appreciate your efforts on sharing the show and the other platforms that we have, our blog, our resource directory, our Dementia Chats webinars where our um, panelists actually have dementia um, along with the radio show. Uh, what else can I tell you about us? Uh, we love what we're doing. We love being connected around the world. And uh, again, I appreciate all of you being part of our community. Before I introduce our guest today, because we're going to be talking about walking a tightrope of sanity, um, I just want to give you a couple of, of free um, opportunities. One, uh, and this kind of can tie into that tightrope of sanity, too, is with fresh books. If you are one who doesn't like keeping track of your personal finances, FreshBooks might be right up your alley. And you can get a 30-day free trial by going to gofreshbooks.com forward slash alive. That's gofreshbooks.com forward slash alive. Another one that can help on that old sanity journey is... um, Audible books, it's a great way when you're really busy um, and sometimes you just don't have time to read, you're driving around or you're multitasking, you can actually go to audibletrial.com forward slash social. That's audibletrial.com forward slash social and pick out a book to be read to you. How would that be? Um, So I want to introduce our guest today. Um, I think we're going to have a really interesting conversation about being an adult child and being a care partner and what that can do to your life as you knew it. Um, Caregiving is such a natural part of what we do in our lives, and sometimes um, most of us, you know, we're going to be in that role in probably more than one level. It, you might be a partner to somebody, uh, you might be a mother or father, you might be a friend, or you might be caring for a parent. The roles are constantly changing in our lives. And Roger Rennick found that when he was caring for an aging parent, many additional emotional aspects and challenges came into play for him. And that sometimes threw his life on uh, kind of unbalanced. And for over 10 years, he was a caregiver to his mother while continuing to still work a high-stress job. 
still be a husband, and still be the father of two. In his case, um, he found that the conclusion of caring for his mom was just the beginning of another challenging chapter. So we're here today to discuss Roger's experiences, um, which I think many of you will will be in, uh, attuned with. So welcome, Roger. Thank you, Laurie, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Well, I'm, I'm excited to have you with us. I always ask this first question to our guests, uh, just so that they kind of have a a basis, but have have you been personally touched with dementia? You know, with your own family or friends? Yeah, uh, yes, I have. Um, certainly, with with family, um, mother specifically, uh, which is what we'll be talking about today, or myself specifically talking about. Um, not necessarily ever totally diagnosed. Um, depression was certainly a part of her life. Dementia could have been a part of it, but it was never formally diagnosed. But through professional experience, certainly have worked with individuals with dementia, have worked with families of individuals with dementia. So it certainly has touched my life as well. Okay. Um, and, I, and I think that's pretty common. Most of us are going to be touched in, in some way, shape, or form. Now, um, when we were talking offline, you had talked about some symptoms of depression um, that were present. Right. Um, can you talk about that um, in your own life? Yeah, absolutely. And w- w- one of the things that I think through, throughout my life, uh, I've been touched w- with that uh, myself. Uh, there is a history of it in my family, uh, you know, specifically my mom. And I think over the course of time, it's a situation or a condition that people have a tendency to live with. And it seems to spark at times over certain life events, um, certainly events that occurred in my life. So, again, going back into my early years, um, I, I do believe, uh, again, I was never really formally diagnosed at that point in my, in my life, but I do believe uh, that there were symptoms of it. Everybody gets sad. Everybody feels sad on occasion. And generally, generally, you, you return to normalcy, uh, bounce back. For me, those times seem to go a little bit longer than usual. But again, it was never really formally diagnosed until much later in my life um, after some very you know, traumatic events with my family. Yeah, and, and I do think depression is something, you know, just about everybody goes through at some point in time, though many may not admit to it because there's such stigma, stigma with depression as well. Um, and yes. and there's so many similarities between depression and uh, dementia that it makes it difficult sometimes for doctors to distinguish, you know, what what's really at play, um, you know, Correct. with things. So um, I think that's an, an important factor to know. What about um, your family and their reaction to kind of what was happening, you know, with your mom and with your role? Yeah, it was one of those situations where, um, as you probably and the audience has probably guessed by now, I am a male of the species. Males, uh, it's always the old adage that you know, men don't talk a lot and don't say a lot. Well, that was certainly my case as well. And I, over the course of time, um, over the course of being a caregiver uh, while still working, and again, as I said, being a husband, a father, I should say, as you said, and it was one of those situations where I didn't talk a lot about how I was actually feeling. I think over the course of time, um, I started to feel that my family certainly were there to support me, to listen to me, but I failed to simply say, I'm not feeling well, or here's what's bothering me today. And over the course of many, 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 many years, uh, keeping that all inside uh, definitely took a toll on me you know, af- afterwards. So again, I, I think the ability to be able to speak about your how you're feeling is certainly important. I know, as I said, I failed to speak a lot about it. I kept a lot of things inside of me, and by nature, that's how I've always been. And I've certainly learned, oh, again, over the course of time, that that's not the best thing to do. So as opposed to years ago, where I wouldn't talk about anything, uh, today you can't shut me up about a lot of things. So, <laughs> so certainly a turn of events for me as I got older, um, but good, a good turn, a good turn for myself. Mm-hmm. Did, did your family notice any signs of, of depression yeah. or frustration with your role you know, in caring for your mom? 
Yeah, and I believe the frustration that was being seen uh, on my family's part was not talked about a lot because they certainly realized, you know, this was my mom. Um, I'm very fortunate in that I have a brother, you know, that we, we shared the role of caregiver and we did things mutually. You know, however, for myself, it, it was uh, being very withdrawn. Um, I found myself being very um, antisocial, if you will. And the withdrawal is something that was very very noticeable to my family. And because of the things that we're going through, um, not saying that they were afraid to talk to me, but they, they kind of let me, let me be because they knew that there was a lot of things that I needed to talk about, but yet failed to do so. So I believe it was the almost separation of my family. Uh, It was my, my wife, my, my son, my daughter, on one side and me on the other. And it's not that they wanted that. That's how I was living, Um, being very withdrawn, not talking about things, just doing the roles that I was doing. And again, failing to talk about it in any detail or at all. Mm -hmm. Um, Did other members, you know, have a have a real active role in your mom's care? Because I know a lot of times there's uh, kind of one primary and and the other ones will step in, you know, if you sometimes if you beg. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, and my and my wife and kids, yeah, I all children. You know, they they would help where they where they could. But I took it on myself. Again, as I said, I have a you know, a brother that we share the role. So we pretty much took command, if you will, of of the care of mom. And that wasn't always an easy task. Um, my father had passed away uh, many years ago, actually in 1982. And I grew up uh, certainly a baby boomer. And you know, my parents, my mom didn't drive. You know, She lived in the house that she lived for over 40, 45 years. I mean, that was her and my dad's first house. Um, that's where I was born. You know, My brother was very young when they moved there. So her decision in life was to remain in her house by her, you know, by herself, even after my dad had passed. And that certainly that role itself, uh, the sudden passing of my father uh, totally changed, obviously, things uh, right from the get go. Um, but for the many, many years following that, uh, my mom was OK. She, you know, she took the bus wherever she needed to go. She was a part of everything that we did as a family, we, you know, we helped her around the house, did what we could. But then as she got older, you know, the dependency became a little bit more there. So, you know, my family was certainly there to, to jump in where they could, but it was always myself or, or my brother that, that were the primary caregivers. Um, we certainly could have included others, but we, this was our mom. So th- this is the role that we took on and, and did the, the majority of it by ourselves. Mm-hmm. How did you figure out between, you know, yourself and your brother who, who was going to be in charge of what roles? Or did you really kind of share? Uh, share yeah, the yeah. We, we really, we, we were, it, we were a team. Um, and I think, you know, companies today would, would, would get a lot of uh, good input from what we did uh, because what he couldn't do, I did what I couldn't do. He did. And, and we worked it. Um, at that time I was working evenings, uh, in my quote, very stressful job unquote. And yes, it was. So, so that actually gave me mornings, you know, and early afternoons to, to go take mom shopping, to help around the house, cut the grass when necessary. So my brother was able to fill in at the other times. Yeah. So we, we alternated roles. We alternated functions. Again, what he couldn't do, I did. What I couldn't do, he did. So we, we had a very, very good system in place. Um, even even though I mean it was still all very demanding on each of us, um, you know we were still able to separate the you know the, the things that we did very well together. So that was certainly a benefit um, to you know to everybody, including our mom. Mm-hmm. Now you know one of the one of the struggles that families have can you know come into finances and stuff. Was that something that that you and your brother had to step in and do for your mom, or was she still able to? care for her own finances yeah she she was for for the for the most part yes she was able to take care of her her own finances 
um, as we, we went through the role that uh, so many families do, um, as the decision was made that she was not able to remain in her house anymore, and that's that's a separate story that I'm sure we'll talk about down the road, but um, it was one of those where anything that she did have went to support her. Um, she went through the process of home, hospital, home, rehab, home, and the the last uh, seven or so years um, were were her finances supporting herself to the point where the finances were no longer there. We certainly jumped in to help where we could, uh, but it was for the most part. You know, my mom was pretty pretty much able to take care of herself through medic Medicare. And then, of course, when the Medicaid hit, um, that's when everything had been depleted, um, and then we were financially helping as well, supporting her in uh, independent living um, until the point where independent living became too much for her, and then she went into an actual nursing home. Okay. Um, Can you kind of describe a, a typical day when you were actively caring for your mom? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um well, it it would be a, a case where we would be you know, going over there, taking her shopping periodically. Um, that would be the the morning part. Just going to visit would be a, another part, uh, just to see how things were. She lived about thirty minutes away, you know, from where I'm currently at, so that was helpful. Um, so it was doing doing that, and then as well as doing things around my own home, you know, take maintenance, cut grass, doing whatever would be necessary. Um, it was the the one benefit that in working evenings for those years is that I was able to see my kids off to school. So I was the I was the dad that was you know my wife went to work and then I you know I got the kids up, gave them their vitamins, bowl of cereal, and off to school. So I did have a little bit of time with them, and then I began uh, would go by my mom's as was said, and then doing things that I needed to do. Um, then it would be basically going to work from there, uh, generally starting around uh, twelve one o'clock in the afternoon, uh, not usually getting home to about 10, 11, sometimes 12 o'clock at night. And that was the cycle uh, throughout a Monday through Friday. Weekends were all over. Uh, Weekends could be, again, you know, doing something with mom, doing something that we weren't able to do during the week, certainly trying to get some time in with my family as much as was possible. And that role, uh, that that cycle just continued on for, for many, many years. So almost every day, every minute, every hour of my week was booked in some fashion. Um, as my mom developed more health con- uh, concerns, that was doctor visits, things like that, which I was able to help out a lot because, again, I was off in the mornings, so I was able to do that, you know, take her. So, uh, again, it, it might not sound like a full week, but when you break it down by the hour, uh, as I said, virtually every hour, minute, second of my week was booked in some fashion. And trying to equally divide my time as much as was possible, you know, as being, you know, with my mom, with my wife, with my kids, and with myself. And that with myself happened very, very sporadically, <laughs> not not very often at all, actually. And, and I think that that's uh, pretty true. We're trying to keep up with all the outer layers, uh, you know, and what we're responsible for, what we want to be part of. And, and it's uh, pretty right. common, I think, for us to forget about us and um, yes. in our yes. own energy level. You know, we're just out there trying to, you know, keep the boat afloat. <laughs> oh, yeah, ab- absolutely. Uh, and again, when, when you when you take that week that I just described, you know, I, you, you might look at it from the outside and go, well, you know, that doesn't sound too well. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, because, again, it, it was a it was a continuous schedule of events. Um, tying into again, you know, personal things, which you know, I'm like for myself, were very you know, didn't happen too often. But again, just being around, you know, to be the husband, father, caregiver, and then being there, you know, if something developed with my mom, uh, you know, again, it could be anything from you know the health to something around the house, some maintenance, something that, you know, it, it, again, it, it was a very, very hectic schedule over the course of uh, several, several years. Okay. How did, how did your kids respond to this? Cause I know sometimes there can be um, changes in behavior due to jealousy yeah. or things not being the way they used to be and not totally understanding, you know, everything that's going on. Cause a lot of times as parents, we, we try to protect our kids 
Um, right. And we don't we don't tell them the whole truth of of what exactly is going on or why it's going on. And I you know I hear that from kids when I go into the schools and talk. And sure, um, they sure. really, they really want to help. So, how you know, how open were you with your own children about your mom's needs and your role, and and what kind of reaction did they have to that? Yeah, it, it was a, a situation where Amaria just being there's so many uh, human emotions that that come into this, and a, a lot of times I, during that time, I even myself, I didn't realize how how many emotional feelings were out there and were just not simply being recognized. My, my kids saw a very busy person who was very frustrated at times. And when I say frustrated, you know, it was my mom. I would do anything for my mom. I loved my mom. There was never any problem like that. But in the same sense, they saw a very busy person that was very, um, being very consumed, uh, and I think perhaps that would be the best word to use, very consumed by what was going on outside of my own family. Um, They saw the frustration and sometimes the anger. And when I say anger, again, it's not, uh, if if anybody was going through the most emotional time of their life, it would be our mom. Um, She lost her husband of many, 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 many years. She was now alone in a house that she was now starting to rely more on other people, you know, you know meaning her sons to, to assist her. So if the, the, the total emotional roller coaster was on anybody, you know, I mean, it was certainly our mom uh, because of what she was going through, how it affected us and how it affected uh, my kids. Um, again, they saw a very busy person. They saw a very frustrated person and, it's sad that I think back and the the memories of grandma are not always pleasant. And that's where, when I talked about the emotional side, you know, uh, grandma was becoming very demanding, if you will, um, because she needed that. She was becoming very, very, very dependent, which she needed. And I think my children saw a very frustrated uh, somebody who needed to sit down and talk about what was going on. And I won't say that they were ever afraid to approach me, but I think they didn't want to because I probably wouldn't have divulged much information myself. I mean, just by simply saying, yes, I'm okay. This is what I have to do. And then out the door I go became the norm. So with that, uh, my, my children, you know, and you know, saying my wife as well became they let it go as was because I don't know that I would have opened up uh, even though I should have. So again, I, they saw a very uh, frustrated, very busy person, but they didn't approach me much about it because I probably wouldn't have responded as much as I should have anyway. Mm-hmm. No, I, I get that. Cause it's, it's all that protection mode. Um, yes. With things yes. And, and trying to maintain and, and, normal, and, you know, and what what's normal is supposed to look like. Absolutely, and it's certainly never ever that my family had, did not have an interest in what was going on. Just the opposite. Just the opposite. But it was me, as I said earlier, it was me that was withdrawing, and they saw that. And to be able to, you know, put me in a corner, stop me, and say, "Whoa, you know, what is going on with you?" I would have just simply responded, uh, nothing, I'm fine, everything's cool, and out the door, again, I go, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. whether it be whatever I was going. So I was being evasive, maybe, you know, mentally and physically being evasive uh, in that, yeah. and and families, uh, I, I think when they see that, you know, I, I think to a certain degree, you'll get to that point where you just let that go, um, because this is how it is. And just let it go, whether that's good or bad, but just let it go because this is the current situation and we're going to just let it, let it play out, if you will. Mm-hmm. Now, you had also mentioned about having to move your mom. So she must have been in yes. in the house probably with your dad and then moved to like an assisted living yeah. visit and then into a nursing home. Um, how did you come about making those decisions? Because that is something I know families struggle oh, with a lot. Yeah, um, one one of the things after, and we'll again we'll we'll talk about this down the road, I'm sure. 
um, the, the aftermath. Um, one of the, the many things that that was becoming a uh, a sense of guilt and. What was happening was a lot of the decisions that were being made were certainly not what mom wanted. Um, the last several years that she was at home, uh, we started going through a period of time where she was having falls. And we we sincerely offered to come and live with my brother, to come to live with, with us. Now, Yes, it would not have been because of, you know, of room, you know, already two kids. Uh, my brother had a third floor condo, no elevator. So there were there there were options there that might not have been the best. But we said, Mom, you, you know, you could come and live with us. And no, no, she said, nope, 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 I'm not going to do that. This is my home, and I'm staying in my home. And as opposed to putting on the boxing gloves and going at it with her, we, we say, okay, all right, this is, this is her choice. And we accommodated her by doing the runs over there when necessary. As I said, we started experiencing, or she started experiencing falling and those were becoming um, very more frequent we we got her a, a cell phone. Well, I should say a portable phone at that time. There the, the old shoebox cell uh, portable phones that she had, and it was it was a very useful tool. But she didn't utilize a lot of it. And nine times out of ten, we would realize she had fallen either after the fact, or we'd go over there and see her sitting in her chair with a bruise on her leg. And that was really becoming uh, difficult for everybody, you know, including herself. The actual decision uh, that was not made by her, but it was made by myself and my brother, was very a very fateful night where um, I had talked to my mom in the morning, and my brother had called me later on in the evening, and he said, Roger, have you talked to mom today? And I said, yeah. I said, I, I called her, you know, talked to her this morning, so I'm trying to call her. Try to reach her. Nobody's answering the phone. So again, if you can imagine that fear, that feeling of panic, um, it's like, okay, this is probably not a good thing. Yeah. So we, uh, my mom's neighbor had a key, but the front door was locked, so they couldn't get in. Um, so it was one of those where we said, okay, we'll, we'll meet over there shortly. So I took off. You know, my brother took off, and we met there at her house. Um, had to break the front door to get in, uh, but we got in, and there was mom laying in the hallway. Um, and it's one of those situations where you get a, like a life alert, you get the little button to push, and it was not, none of that was being utilized. And Lori, I'll, I'll always say that there's certainly nothing funny in this, but there are a lot of times in in life at the most difficult times where you can look back and almost find a little bit of humor. And I'll explain what I, what I mean. There's certainly nothing funny in the story itself. But when we got to our mom, we called 911. Um, there she is, you know, again, laying on the floor. And when we asked her, Mom, why didn't you call somebody? Why didn't you? The response was, I didn't want to, I didn't want anybody to know. I didn't want anybody to know. So the thought was um, that, you know, she didn't want the news team pulling up and running into the house and filming her laying on the floor. She didn't want anybody to know. You know, she didn't want anybody to know. So she chose to lay there. So that was the time when we decided this cannot go any longer. It's not good for her. And it certainly wasn't good for, you know, for anybody. So the decision was made where, Mom, you can't stay at home any longer. So we did the the role of uh, take offering to take her to look at places. Nope, nope, I didn't want to do that. So she was in a hospital for some time after that uh, because of the fall. Um, she had high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, had a broken hip many many years ago. So she just re-injured that by this by the last fall. So we uh, we did the shopping around to find somewhere that she could go and. For a brief time, uh, it's honest to say that we almost became the enemy uh, because we were now making that choice for her, but we had to. 
We had to. This was this was all that could happen. The the, the the guilt factor comes where, yeah, we had to do this. We had to do this. And, Laurie, I'll, I'll say this. I, I generally have a tendency to get a little weepy around this time because it was a very, um, very difficult time. But when my our, our mom was leaving her home, um, when she was going out, uh, because it's one of those where – you do the slow motion look behind, um, and and she did as she was being carried down the stairs uh, with the ambulance. Uh, she gave that look, you know, turn around, and it's like this is probably going to be the last time I'm here, and yeah, that's actually what wound up happening. Um, so it was a very, very, very emotional, stress-filled time for all of us, even though, you know, we, we knew that this is, this was the only option now, um, because this is what she needed. And we had to uh, take, take a deep breath and make this decision for her, which we did. Yeah. And and that's never easy because most of us promise that's not going to happen. And, you know, we do right. everything in our power to make that not happen, but sometimes it, it really is the best choice. But as a right. son or a daughter, right. you, you sure don't feel that way. Um, no, no, not when, at all. When you're not going through that, going through that process, how did she? How did she take the move? Um, were uh, you... Now, it it never um, it it never was the same afterwards. It was a, a, a few years. Um, she went to independent living to start um, when, when she, you know, she got out of the hospital and rehab again. Uh, she didn't like it. She hated it. She hated the food. She hated the people. She isolated herself. And due to health concerns, um, over less than a year later, uh, she actually – the independent living became too much for her, and it was very respectfully stated that she was no longer appropriate, if, if that's the right term to use, for independent living because her needs were becoming much greater. So after that, it, it became assisted living and then you know, in, eventually into a nursing home. Um, she never totally accepted it, um, which was another factor of, of all those years of guilt and the feelings that we had to do this. You know, we visited her regularly. We, we, you know, our families got together. We took her out, you know, for holidays. Um, but it was never quite the same um, after the move from the house because it was, you know, her realization too, you know, that her life was changing yeah, uh, and not necessarily in the better way. We, we also, and, and just to, to say this we're, with the frustration part, we, we also feel, you know, and, and I specifically have always said that our, our, our mom, she didn't support herself a lot. And we think, you know, and again, we'll never know, but we think her, her life could have been much better had she accepted things better, had she had given more effort to make things better for herself. Um, I believe that she was so dependent on others that she became well, way too dependent and she stopped thinking for herself. And if she'd have had more, um, I, I don't know if the, the word is initiative, but had she had taken better or looked at things a little bit differently, I think her life could have been much better those last several years. Unfortunately, you know, like I said, her after the house, uh, after the move, um, you know, she never totally accepted anything. Mm -hmm. Which, which is pretty common. And it's hard when those relationships shift like that, oh, yeah. you know, and you're, and you're struggling so hard to do the right thing. And, uh, right. There's just that burden of guilt, no matter how logical you can process everything in your head, you still feel right. like you you let them down somehow, even though you you know you looked at all different options. And I think sure. that that's sure. uh, such a common thing that families, well, family and friends deal with. Um, oh know, yeah, when it when and, it comes to caring. And, yeah, yeah, and seeing that, you know, I mean, again, you know, here here I go with the word emotional again, but. Uh, you know, I, I think of my kids, and they remember grandma as being a very unhappy woman. You know, I mean, my, my wife, the same thing. Uh, 
you know, it, it, it's sad um, because, again, it's certainly, you know, not the situation with, with my wife's, uh, I mean, my, her, her dad specifically. Um, he passed away several years ago, but he was just the opposite. He chose. He said, I, I need to get out of my condo. He said, I'm getting too old to take care of things. He was very self-sufficient. Um, he chose to to move. And he was a bundle of joy to the day he passed away. Uh, he was just the opposite, just the opposite. And I'm certainly not comparing, but I am, you know, in the sense of one individual, you know, passed away, a very unhappy woman. And, you know, my father-in-law was just a bundle of life and energy and, you know, just an incredible person, as, as was my mom. But again, miserable to, you know, in her own mind, uh, she was just a very miserable person, which was so unfortunate because that's not how she was, you know, in life, you know, up to that point. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you think the added stress of caring for your mom, um, you know, it caused your depression to accelerate? Yeah, I'm sorry, but you can, you can, I think you can hear that I have an affirmative yes uh, to, to, to that answer. Um, I, I do. When when my mom passed away, um, and that was actually in 2004, and it's amazing. I'll I'll share my story, and so there's so many times where if it's somebody who doesn't know you know my, my personal life, you know I'll get that look like you're you're talking about this like this just happened. I said, well, you know, actually we're we're talking 12 years ago, but yet the memories are certainly fresh. And after um, when my mom passed away and when we're adding to the factor again about guilt and how how things change, you know, in your in your mind, um, when we, we found out that, you know, my mom was going into hospice, uh, she was her, her body was between the uh, congestive heart failure. Um, she was having issues with her kidneys. And we found out you now that that she was going to be going into hospice, which, again, you know, it's like, wow, uh, you know, this is here. Here's another chapter, you know, of of the book. And uh, me and my brother were were with her, um, and we were there well into the evening. And and I want to say a time maybe ten, eleven o'clock at night, uh, when we first got the di- you know, the diagnosis for her that it wasn't good. And we were told you know, that it would be probably a couple of weeks, perhaps a month or so. And we spent some, you know, the time at the at the home with her. And we left again around maybe eleven ish or so. And uh, we, you know, we we left, got home. Um, my my brother called me. Uh, he he was the first call. Uh, he called me about four o'clock in the morning, you know, to let me know that mom had died. So uh, I said, okay, you know, we'll we'll meet over there. And as you can tell, <laughs> I'm and I'm not laughing. But this is a nervous laugh because I I know I get a little. Emotion on the side, but you know, it it was another factor to the guilt and, mm-hmm. and to the things that happened. That here we are, you know, we were there with her, and we left. And you know, six hours, four hours later, she she passed away by herself. Um, so that 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 you would think that you would think would would be a, a semi conclusion to to the story. And, you know, with the memories to live on afterwards. But um, for, for me, um, it, it actually began a whole new um, chapter, if you will, because after my mom's passing, you know, after, after things were, I mean, the house was sold or house was sold over the, over the course of the time, um, I, I remained withdrawn. I, I remained very um, distant, distant to my family, to my children, um, to the point where I was having uh, moments where I'd start crying, uh, and I, I, I said something's going on here. Um, but but again, you know, I'm I'm tough. I'm gonna you know tighten that belt. I'm gonna you know deal with this, and life is gonna continue. And it well, it did. You know, it did continue. Um, but I was increasingly becoming detached. I was increasingly becoming withdrawn from my family, and I, I use I keep using that term withdrawn. But uh, yeah, that's that's what it was, to the point where um, I I mean I I could be out with my family. Fourth um, uh, of July is is very uh, memorable, in that I remember going to a to a Fourth of July fireworks display, and my family is sitting there watching. All the everybody in the 
audience, oohs, ahs, laughing, smiling, and I, I'm sitting there crying. And I said, okay, some, something is wrong here. Something is wrong here. So I finally, uh, you know, on encouragement from my entire family, uh, went for some professional help, which was the best thing I ever did. And over the course of the next several years, went through therapy and, um, you know, bounced back and lived to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Well, good for you. And, and good for you for being honest and open. So many people are so fearful of of talking about things like this, but it's way more common than, yeah. than, uh, than people know, um, because oh, it, it's such a hidden, hidden thing. But this is a, a real common, common situation. I know when my dad died, um, I spun, I just kept reliving his death over mm-hmm. and over and over and over and over and how I could have done it differently. And I, and I was there, you know, when he died, where, um, I, and I've heard stories of people, the guilt of not being there and we waited and then we were yeah. exhausted and we went home just to take a shower and come back and, and they yeah. left. But, you know, the hospice nurses will tell you over and over again too, that, um, some people don't want you there. It's just too hard yes. for them to leave when you are there. So, um, yeah. you know, this is a, this is a good thing, you know, if, if they are able to, to pass, um, Yep. And it's their time. But, yeah. you know, we beat ourselves up thinking, well, I should have been there. I should have. But, you know, some people would just rather do it alone because as much as you don't want them to leave, they don't want to leave either. You know. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so yeah, that's and, important. And, and, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, so, you know, it's just important to be able to, to um, get your feelings out and tell people how, you know, how you feel about them. And, um you know, just have, even if it's that quiet time, even if they can't respond, you know, and just mm-hmm. what they've meant in your life so that you know you've said everything. But it's, there's right. there's always something that you're going to, you know, have left unsaid because that happens in our daily life all the time. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, in, and, and in a crisis, it's going to happen too. That's just uh that's just part of it, but um, it it yeah. is a tough thing to to let go of that guilt. Um, oh, absolutely! And it, it, it's again, it, it's interesting when um, you know when family when when we had you know, after our mom's passing and everything, and when when we'd have family family gatherings and my you know, my brother and his family were there and everything, we we'd always seem to find ourselves him and me in one room. And and this wasn't a separation. It wasn't a withdrawal. It was just him and me talk where we would sit in one room and our our wives and whoever else was there would be in another. And we would just start talking about mom. And it was one of those things where it it should have been, even before I started going for therapy, it, it, it was, it should have been one of those little, little dings that it's like, you know, what are you, what are you doing? We're talking something we hadn't done or something I hadn't done in just the ability to sit down and open the mouth and express feelings. It sounds so simple, but yet for some people, uh, you know, myself at that time included, you know, it was probably the most difficult thing I, I could find to do. And because of that, I just simply didn't do it. And just keeping that all bottled up inside, you know, as I said earlier, years ago, you know, I, I rarely talk about this. Now you can't shut me up. I, and I, I think that's a good thing because I, I've learned to, you know, as, as was said about express your feelings. Um, and it's interesting to know that for some people, keeping those feelings bottled up inside is so can be so detrimental uh, it can to your mental health it really can have a take a role you know in bringing you down <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? and for myself yeah it certainly did it certainly did you know but yeah you know, like i said now you can't you can't keep me quiet about it because i i've learned i've learned people want to talk about it but sometimes they just don't know how to begin the conversation you know? and that and that's and that's unfortunate you know that's unfortunate yeah it's it's one of those things we need to um, teach, you know, that it's, yes. it, that it's okay to even have this conversation, <laughs> but right. you know, yes. people don't yes. like to be vulnerable. We don't think we're supposed to be vulnerable. Um, but it's important. Um, it's, it's very yeah. important. Um, and, and, and it just, um, it tightens your relationships. People are afraid people are going to 
run away. But, um, you know, typically, you know, if you're in line with somebody, uh, you're going to, um, you're going to have a tighter relationship if, if in fact that you, that you're aligned and if you're not, that's okay too. You know, that part of that letting go, because we all want to be around people that we click with. And, right. um, but we're, again, we're really afraid of not being accepted, which is too right. bad, which is too bad. Um, it, it is. Oh, go ahead. No, I, I, I was going to say, I, I mean, mentioned what, you know, as I grew older you know, mm-hmm. and uh, as I'm growing older, you know, to, to, to communicate to somebody, and this sounds like such a huge cliche, but when you use the term, you are not alone, you know, you hear that and you go, yeah, okay, we're right. Everybody says that. Well, you know, it, it's so true. And, and I've seen that over the course of the last couple of years. Cause I, I started doing like little speaking engagements. And I, when I say little, I mean, speaking engagements on this subject, just like what we're talking about. And it's incredible. The, the people that think that this is what's going on in their life only. They're the only ones that this is happening to, and their level might be different. I mean, no, and it probably will be because everybody's level of everything is different. But it's amazing to find out the people that still think, you know, I'm doing this by myself. There is absolutely nobody else in this world that is going through what I, you know. But when you share that with others, they say, oh, by the way, yeah, I, I, here's what I went through. And they go, oh, really? You know, and you start that conversation or start that sharing. It, it just, from the human side, is comforting. You know, and that's what I have found. You know, that's mm-hmm. what I found out. Uh, you know, I, I think it's as much therapeutic for me, even talking as we are. I think it's as therapeutic for me today as it was 10 years ago. And I think that'll always be because I, I've learned a different avenue now to be able to talk about it without shame or fear or guilt. Um, acceptance has been the biggest word that I've come up with over the last several years. Um, acceptance. Yeah, it's very important. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah. I agree. It kind of reminds me of just our memory cafes, you know, that, that sense of community and the power of that. We we for, mm-hmm. we forget yeah. the importance of of feeling like we belong with that. Yeah. What what would you recommend to other families in similar situations? Yeah, I I, I think and and it's going to be so difficult to say. Well, here's here's what you need to do. You need to talk about it because again, you're going to have the response. Oh well, uh, oh I do, I do. I, I I talk about this. I talk about that. I think it's it's important um, if there's groups out there, and, and I don't the, the term support group. Um, I actually started one through through a through a, a, a healthcare facility, and it was so indirect. Um, it, it it started indirectly. I did a speaking uh, presentation there on this subject. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And it's not because I was the facilitator or the leader, what, what have you. It was a group of about 35 people, you know, including myself, that were bonding because we were sharing stories about this. And when you use the term support group, um, if somebody would have said to me, you know, 14 years ago, you you know, you're a caregiver, you you probably could use a support group. But my instant response would have been, well, heck no, I, I don't need support. What support mean? You know? And I, I think, you know, the response to that is, yeah, you probably do. You probably d- do need somebody to talk to, to share ideas with. So the long answer to, a, to your question is, I, I think if you're able to talk about it more openly, to actually share the fear, the frustration, and the anger. Um, our, our mom made me very angry at times, as I'm sure I did her. But I, I say, well, no, this can't be. This can't be. Yeah. And I think the, the human emotional side has to come out, and that works differently for everybody. And it's, it's hard to say to somebody, okay, talk about it. Let's get it off your mind, get it out there, you're going to feel better. Because it doesn't necessarily work that way. It, mm-hmm. it has to be somebody who's receptive to knowing that their life is very frustrating right now, their life is very complicated right now, and perhaps they need a little little sense of direction as far as where, where to go, what to do. 
and just simply talk about it. Again, long answer, but it, I think if you seek support, uh, assistance, I think that is very, very, very helpful to those um, in stressful situations. Mm-hmm. Agree. Agree. Yeah. Um, why um, Why do you think people won't reach out for professional therapy? I, I think it's it's still the stigma. Um, when when you say that, yeah, I, I went f- for therapy for for many many years because I needed it. I think it's still that stigma that you are you're not able to take care of yourself that you need help. Mm-hmm. And I think today people still think that they can do this on their own. Um, I perhaps it's it's because they don't realize when you think of therapy or you know it, it's like ooh you know they're going to hook me up to wires I'm going to get yeah you know, well not necessarily that's that's it it's so much so much is just simply talking it's opening up your mouth getting your innermost feelings out letting somebody else hear that and then connecting however you can, you know, in, in whatever, whatever area you can. But I think it's still the stigma uh, of saying that you need help or that you need support. A lot of people do, but they don't want to admit it because they feel like they're being weak, you know, that they're not strong. Um, and I think, unfortunately, in today's society, today's world, another cliche there, but, you know, you hear about the individuals who are going through or have gone through um bouts of depression, whatever it might be, just the, just being able to talk about something that's bothering them, you know, and in some cases you see some very, um, very bad, very bad uh, results from not taking care of yourself. So again, I, I think it's the stigma of somebody saying, yes, I need some support. I need some help and perhaps a lack of resources to those who don't realize that there's more out there than they realize. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, anything else that you want to to share with people? This has just been a very interesting conversation today, and I appreciate oh, you sharing your story. Well, oh, thank you. No, yeah, I, I, I think yeah, my story. Um, I, I put together, as I said, a, it was a support group, and I can try to come up with a with a, a title that would be appropriate. And I wound up coming up with the name of chapters. And I, I think the whole story that I have, I'm sure there's people out there that have had situations that are perhaps 10 times more intense, more dramatic, more emotional than mine. And I think there's people out there that have had 10 degrees lighter experience that I've had. Everybody's experience is different. And I, I think the most important thing is to realize that to to feel to feel good about yourself of what you're doing. Um, and if you're in a situation that you're doubting, or you're, you're, you're coming across a situation that's highly stressful. Um, unfortunately that is life. And I do think that there are ways to make yourself feel better. you know, going for walks, going, you know, seeking professional therapy, getting into a, a, a group, an assistance group. Yeah. Again, my story is one out of a hundred zillion that are out there. But I also think it, it's important to be able to openly communicate, and it's very important to openly share stories with other people, because you might not realize it, but I think the the, the human nature is still one of care, uh, and I think there are individuals who do want to hear what's going on. Um, I, I think a lot of times people just have a tendency to say, uh, you don't want to hear about me. You don't want to hear about me. And, and that's a sad that's probably true for a lot of people don't want to hear about it, but there are also a lot of people who do want to hear, you know, and to share, because as I said, I, I still believe that, you know, today's world is one of caring and uh, it just doesn't come out often enough. Agree. Agree. Um, what is the best way for people to get hold of you? Is it through your email, Roger? Yeah, yeah, my my email would would be fine. Um, again, I I it's uh, it's should, should I give it or sure, <laughs> I don't sure. want to plug myself here, but uh, you know it, it's just very simply R is in Roger, S is in Sam, R E N I K, the number two at att dot net. So R S Renick, the number two at att dot net. Um, that's that's always the best way. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking time to to speak with us and share your story. I think it'll help a lot of people out there um, struggling um, with the same challenges that you went through. Oh, well, thank you, Laurie. And again, I certainly appreciate of your of your interest, you know, in allowing me to to speak today. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Well, we will we will keep in touch. Um, for those Absolutely. of you that yeah. are new to our live and social network, you might want to check out Apples to Apples Sunday evening with Scott and Drew Applebaum. They're a father and son team who discuss sports, and you'll be able to find out if father always knows the best or not. Um, our last radio shows, I'm just going to highlight a couple of them that I think you might have some interest in. Uh, we had Dr. Larry Force on, and he was talking about the detoxing of caregivers. We also had the author of the book called Calmer Waters, The Caregiving Journey Through Alzheimer's and Dementia, which was a really interesting conversation. And we had the co-founder of GrandPad, which is a new technology to help families comfortably connect through technology. Um, and then we also had an episode on sports and concussions and dementia uh, with an NFL player and a basketball player um, that had some great insights and talked about what they're, uh, what they're doing to um, change some of the rules and also educate our school systems. Our upcoming show, we are going to have uh, next Tuesday the Rises Project on. And that is about Alzheimer's and the electronic house. And then on Thursday, we are going to have somebody from Australia talking about sensory chairs. Uh, We tried to have them on before, and we had some difficulty um, connecting um, because they had moved and and so forth. So I'm really excited to have that on. These chairs look very, very interesting. This morning on Dementia Chats, we had our uh, new live one. I'll get that posted probably in the next two days. Very interesting discussion with our experts living with dementia about their decision-making process and how it changes as the disease progresses, what their thoughts are, what their, um, what their thoughts are of their care partners as well. And then we also got into driving and when to make that decision. And uh, one of our panelists, Paul Ann Gordon, Um, just gave up her car and sold it. And she talks about why she chose to do that. Our um, prior session, we discussed um, about the power of advocacy and how they plan on passing the wand um, so that other voices can be heard. Our next Dementia Chats will be August 9th, and that will be at 11 Eastern, 10 Central, 9 Mountain Time, 8 Pacific, and 4 o'clock if you're over in London. Our last Conscious Caring resource, which is a video platform of interviews, we had Vince um, Zangaro on, and he's the founder of the Alzheimer's Music Fest, which is coming up, I believe, August 6th in Atlanta. So if you're in that area, check it out. I was there a couple of years ago. It was just a blast. They have a quite the lineup um, of musicians. And our next Conscious Caring resource that will be coming out next week will be with Scott Chapin, um, he is the co-founder of caregivinganswers.com and the Senior Providers Network. Um, last, I just want to give a shout-out to um, people in Iowa. If you are going to be around the North uh, Iowa Community College or Mindframe Theaters in Dubuque, um, come and see me. We are going to be doing a free screening of His Neighbor Phil on Wednesday, August 10th at 6.30, and you don't have to register to go. Um, And then there'll be a conference on the 11th. I'd love to to meet you. A couple of articles I want to point out. Kevin Wu did one on um, a farewell to Pat Summit. We had a beautiful poem submitted by a daughter called 56 Years, and Carol Larkin wrote an article on why are there not enough caregivers to help the elderly. Um, Until next time, have a brilliant week. Thanks, everybody. Bye now. Hi, this is Suzanne Newman, host of the Answers for Elders podcast and radio show. We are the North Star that guides you through the complicated journey of senior care with trusted experts in money, law, living solutions, and more. So join us on this station, your favorite podcast channel, or just go to AnswersForElders.com. Meet the Wayshowers who will help your journey a lot easier.